Great. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we've got a few more that are going to come and grab seats, but we're going to go ahead and get started um, since it's just a little after six. Uh, thank you for being here. Welcome um, to, uh, to our event this evening. Um, my name is Elena McCargo. I am the uh, co-vice president of the Housing Finance Policy Center here at the Urban Institute. Um, I'd like to um, thank our co-sponsor for this event, CoreLogic, um, for their participation in this and also for the um, um, great presentations and data that they're going to share with us uh, this evening. Um, thank you all for joining. I, I, this is going to be a really important discussion. Um, I want to kind of just set the stage a little bit for, for how the evening is going to go, and then we'll get right into, um, into the meat of things. Um, I, I, before we start the program tonight, I, do th I would be remiss if I did not take one minute to recognize uh, the importance of this day. Um, today we are commemorating the 50-year anniversary of uh, President Lyndon B. Johnson's signing of the Fair Housing Act into law on April 11, 1968, 50 years ago. Um, that law was created to end discriminatory practices and activities related to housing. Uh, renters and owners are to be protected under that law. And um, as we discussed disasters this evening, I was thinking about the importance uh, of ensuring fair and equitable uh, recovery to all people when it comes to um, when it comes to housing and as we think about sort of uh, what happens in the aftermath of, of disasters uh, so it really is an important connection between what the Fair Housing Act's intentions were um, and the and the impacts that it has and that and that these disasters have on on people's lives um, regardless of what neighborhood you live in uh, what color you are um, whether you rent whether you own um, as we look at reinvestment and rebuilding um, in places like Houston and Puerto Rico, as we hear about the distressful, the stressful events on so many families, we just keep the ideals of the Fair Housing Act in mind. And I think that will uh, come through as the panel has the conversation later this, this evening um, about uh, the impacts to consumer finance, um, the, the impacts to um, housing, and, uh, and, and the needs of, of the communities um, that are served. So we are going to um, um, first start off with a couple of um, well, a couple of housekeeping things. First, let me welcome the online audience because we do have this uh, live webcast happening this evening. Um, if you are um, engaging with us online or in the room, please feel free to, uh, if you're on a Twitter, if you're tweeting, uh, use the hashtag live at urban um, for this event. Um, all the speakers' Twitter handles um, and information are in the agendas that everyone has. Those agendas are also available online. Um, and so um, if you have questions and you'd like to submit those, obviously in the room, that's easy. If you're online, you can send your questions to events at urban.org. Anytime during the program, those will come to me and we'll make sure to, to get those questions answered. Uh, so we're going to begin the stage tonight um, by, by uh, or setting the stage tonight um, using some data and evidence from some great research that's been done uh, from both a property and a personal finance and consumer perspective. Um, so, and then we're going to bring up a panel after we hear those um, presentations to really talk through from, from an industry perspective, from a uh, local perspective um, on the ground, and um, as well as, uh, you know, in a government perspective uh, about, about what we heard and, um, and have some Q&A. We will leave time uh, at the end for, for questions. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to first introduce um, Howard Kunst, who is the chief actuary from CoreLogic's science and analytics team, who is going to discuss the findings from their national hazard risk report. And after Howard uh, comes up, we're going to move right into a presentation from Fiona Grieg, who is the director of consumer research at the J.P. Morgan Chase Institute. And she's going to present the results from their recent research and findings on financial impacts on consumers from hurricanes Harvey and Irma. And then, uh, and then afterwards, the panel will come back up and we'll 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 dive into um, into the details. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Howard uh, from CoreLogic to to start the presentation. Howard, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And here's a picture. Is this on? Okay, good. So I get the honor of being the first up here to kind of set the stage a little bit about you know what happened in 2017, and you know why it was such a, a kind of a, a an interesting uh, set of uh, circumstances and all of the uh, the catastrophes we had last year. Um, 
again, here's, a, here's the uh, link to our, uh, our, our annual report that goes out. There's an executive summary and there's tabs by, uh, by the individual types of uh, uh, hazards, whether it be hurricanes or floods or wildfire. And you can get all that and it's, it's, it's all online if you want to look at it later. You know, this is really, and we do this in a map form sometimes as well, but, but according to NOAA, there were 16 weather climate disaster events last year that exceeded $1 billion worth of, of losses. That's just amazing. I mean, it used to be where a billion dollars of loss was, was such a random thing, but there, was, there were 16 of them last year. It's just, it's, it's getting to a point, um, you know, part of it is where people are living. I mean, it's, they're living on the coast. They're, they're living in flood prone areas. They're, they're living in California where, where there's wildland. And so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's, there's just a function of where people are. Uh, just some, again, some, some excerpts from the uh, report and from the executive summary. Again, there were 17 named storms, uh, 10 hurricanes and six major hurricanes, and including, uh, you know, Harvey and Irma. And, and we're talking about, you know, some of the things leading up to, to, to Harvey and, and um, I remember looking at it earlier in the week and I saw there was this, you know, this little tropical depression that's sitting over the Yucatan and I, I looked and what the forecast was and, and it, it really did forecast, you know, a few days ahead of time that it was going to go up the coast, build, build power and then just sit there for a couple of days in rain. Now, it ended up being a little bigger than they, they thought, but uh, we'll talk about some of those numbers later, but um, just the flooding from Harvey and Irma together, uh, anywhere between 69 and 105 billion in, in flood loss. Now that wasn't all insured. Um, we, uh, you say that we know like in, in, in down in the Houston, the Southern uh, Texas area, 75% of the buildings that were, were damaged weren't insured. So there's a you know, significant financial pressure that's put on, uh, on the marketplace. Um, Winds, I mean, we haven't had a, a major hurricane a few year, in a few years, so there was wind even though, you know, they weren't really wind events. They still were, were some winds to these events. Um, and talking about winds, tornadoes, uh, third most active year with, with uh, over 1,500 tornadoes last year. Um, that, that's a pretty good number, and, and we'll see some, some charts in a little bit. But it's, it's interesting, if you go back in history, you do see these times where you get uh, a few years of ramped up tornado and hail activity and people say is that a trend and then the next few years is back down again so you see these trends in, in, uh, in convective storms. But there was, you know, a, a rare, you know, uh, Denver is not normally a hail area. Uh, eastern Colorado is hail prone but not Denver itself but there was a, uh, a big hail event last year that was uh, 150,000 autos were, were damaged. Uh, wildfire. Again, we, we've all heard about the, the California wildfires. I mean, we had the northern wildfires, and then, then uh, later there were some down in the uh, near the LA area. But um, you know, it, well, we've got some some slides here in a little bit that has a little more detail on it. But um, you know, the Tubbs fire in Santa Rosa, there was 5,600 structures that were burned, and um, the interesting thing about that, we've done a lot of work on that. The interesting thing about the, the Tubbs fire was that that event, it happened so fast, uh, there were like anywhere from 70 to 90 mile an hour winds that were blowing. And uh, the, the term that is used to describe it is called urban conflagration. One, one home started on the end, you know, and, and most of these homes were, were a mile or two miles from the actual vegetation that burnt. And the winds carried them carried embers over a mile to start the first one. And because those winds are so uh, blowing so hard, it just fueled those flames and the flames would burn. It would, it would burn the next home and then the next home because they were all, they were not very far apart. Um, again, so here's a little more detail uh, on Harvey and Irma. You can see the numbers. We had the 60 to $105 billion. Um, most of it was, was re residential, but in, in, in the Houston area, there was a lot of commercial damage. And uh, the, in, what I found is interesting, looking at the statistics around the, uh, the Harvey event, was that in Houston alone, Houston, Sugartown, uh, Baytown, 
there were over 250,000 structures that were built in a flood zone. And uh, I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about that, but, but it's, it's interesting that the, the codes will allow that many structures to be built in a 100-year FEMA flood zone. And then another almost oh, 500,000 that were, were high risk, which are ones that are just outside of a flood zone that are, that are really close in, in, in a big event will have it. So there's, I mean, there's three quarters of a, of a million you know, homes that are you know, right in the path of, of a flood if anything happens in, in Houston. Um, I talk about this too. So, I mean, in, in the, the South Texas, Louisiana, that was affected by, by Harvey, you see that the blue numbers are the, uh, the areas and what, what the, the potential area of, uh, of uh, damage would be. And you can see about you know, just under 10% had, had very high risk or, or extreme risk. And, but that comprised about 35% of the loss. And as, as we were alluding to in the previous slide, 65% of what was damaged was, was not even in a flood zone. So it, it is a very remarkable information there you see all that damage from areas that are outside of a flood zone. So, um, it's, so it's something that p people really need to be aware of. And you know, when we talked about, about this and we did some, some work with our customers, uh, both on the insurance side and, and the, uh, the mortgage space, understanding what, what that risk is, is uh, the, uh, the mortgage brokers, the mortgage companies, are the holders really found this interesting as well. Uh, just generally on the hurricanes themselves, I mean, let's talk about what happened relative to the, uh, to the, the normal average. And we hadn't had a, uh, a major storm hit Florida in, 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 uh, in 2016. Matthew skirted the coast and, and flooded some areas, but it really didn't produce any major damage. And, and uh, Harvey and Irma were the first two that really hit in, in quite a while that actually made landfall. Um, so you know, it was a little more active year, and I think... Um, I saw the early results just came up out last week, and I think they're predicting a slightly you know, higher than average year of, of uh, hurricanes again. And you know, again, this is, a, this is a pretty good graphic talking about how much area was affected by, uh, in the United States, affected by, by you know, hurricane force winds. And you can see it's really been nothing up until you know, 2017, so it's really been you know, 10 years since there's really been significant. I mean, you talk about Florida, uh, 2004 and 2005 had some, some you know, a number of events. And then um, Katrina was, oh, was that 05 as well? So, I mean, it had been, you know, you know, you know quite, a while, quite a while since we've had any, any really major damage from, from hurricanes with, in the United States, um, it, which, is, uh, which is, you know, odd. But, I mean, it uh, goes through streets. It's all random. Wildfire, again, so, you know, we, we talk about this with our wildfire scientists, and, and I, I think up until like two or three years ago, the majority of, of wildfires that, that, you know, were significant that you could, you could count were caused by natural, uh, like lightning and just natural activity. But it succeeded that now, now there's like 60% oh, like of all the fires that are the wildfires are started by, by human error, some, some type of human activity, and not just you know, natural causes. Um, but here you can see on, on the, uh, the chart on the right, five of the, uh, the, the 2017 uh, California wildfires uh, are in the top 20 of, of all time in, in California for, for numbers of structures destroyed, and, and Tubbs is now number one for the, for the, most, for the you know, most damage. And, and I think you know, the... Uh, I, f I forget what the latest estimate is, but it's a, it's a pretty large you know, dollar sign with all that. Um, I know there was one, in, one insurance company, I was reading their, uh, their profile the other day, and there was one insurance company itself just in the Northern California fires posted a $1.2 billion loss number, just, just their own book. That's, uh, that's a pretty large number. And they are using information on, on wildfire risks in, in, their, in their underwriting decisions. So that's really amazing that they, that they would have that much. Earthquakes. Um, 
I was in California a, about a month ago, and we did a little, little uh, field trip with our science and analytics team at CarLogic, and we actually went down to Fremont and saw on, on, a, on a location at, at the Fremont Town Center, you could see the Hayward Fault, where it actually is, the crack, you can see it's moving. The Hayward Fault's moving at like two millimeters per year, and you can see you know, the, the, the west side is moving north and the, the east side is moving south, and you can see it, and it's kind of separating. And um, the interesting thing about that is they're, they're doing a lot of uh, preparation in, in the San Francisco Bay Area right now because uh, they've been able to map over history that the Hayward Fault ruptures with a six and a half or seven or larger every 150 years on average. And it's been 149 years and a half, 149 and a half years since the last major rupture. So I think the number right now is that, you know, not to scare you guys, but there's a 70% a chance that the Hayward Fault will rupture at, with a six and a half or greater in the next 25 years. So earthquakes, the, the interesting thing about earthquakes is because you know they're going to happen because the, the, the pressure builds up, the pressure builds up. The longer you go without one, the more likely you're going to have, uh, whereas most other weather events, you, know, you can say the more random. Um, you can see, you know, the number of, number of 3.0 or greater earthquakes. It's not California, Oklahoma. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, in, it's, it's interesting. I live in, in the Dallas area, and about uh, three years ago, we had a, had a, uh, a spat of earthquakes as well. Um, you know, if they're, it's from fracking the disposal wells, and it puts all the pressure on. And, and I went 53 years of my life without feeling a single earthquake, and then the next month and a half, I felt 25 of them. It was just amazing. There was one. There was one 24-hour period that we had 12 earthquakes. It just all kept going. They were. They were. They ranged from like two and a half to 3.7. I think was the highest one. And I, I tell that to my, our. our earthquake modeling staff out in, in California that I was, you know, felt, felt all these earthquakes and say, you're even feeling a three? I'm like, yeah, because it's a different soil and, and it just, it, it feels like your house goes wham. Um, but it's tailing off a little bit. You see the, uh, the, the uh, even, in, even Oklahoma, there was nothing. They, they started uh, drilling, went up, and now it's coming back down. They actually are, you know, trying to be more proactive in, in man, managing what they're doing with the, uh, with the, uh, the wells. Hail, again here, I talked a little bit about it before. Hail, up and down, uh, no big patterns, but uh, you saw, I know uh, I was still in the insurance business at the end of, you know, in 2012, and that was, was uh, a, a big year uh, for my company. I, I was chief actuary at an insurance company in, in Dallas, and uh, we experienced a lot of, lot of hail losses. And, in that year, um, but it's but it's uh, you know no major trends here, so it's not really increasing. And that's it on the uh, 2017 summary. And I'll be uh, on the panel for for questions later. Great, that was a fantastic overview of all of the disasters that um, occur in our country, but. Um, what we've been doing at the J.P. Morgan Chase Institute is to um, call from the lens that we have on consumers, businesses, uh, across roughly half the households in the U.S. that we have a relationship with, what can we learn from what's going on in the checking accounts about how people weather these disasters financially. So uh, earlier uh, this, this quarter, this, this, this year, we released actually three pieces of research. Um, one called Weathering the Storm, which focused on the consumer perspective. A million people uh, who resided in, in Texas or Florida. Uh, but we also released two other reports that I'll just mention, uh, describing the small business perspective based on 40,000 small businesses in Houston and Miami, as well as sort of the local consumer commerce picture, which was based on 24 billion transactions in Houston and Miami. So across a couple of different lenses, we were able to uh, shed light on what impacts these hurricanes have on people, businesses, and, consumer at, uh, and commerce at large. So from the consumer perspective, again, I mentioned a million people in hurricane-affected areas in Texas and Florida. We focused in on Houston and Miami, though. 
And I'll go through a couple of different perspectives. So first we looked at the inflows. What happened to people's income? And there are other sources of, uh, of inflows, be they government inflows, uh, transfers from other accounts, social security inflows, whatever it might be. And what, you can, what you're seeing here is a daily view. Actually, it's a, it's a running weekly average, but I'm, I'm showing you kind of that each and every day leading up to uh, and after landfall of the hurricane. So in Houston, that was August 25th uh, for Hurricane Harvey, and then in Irma, it was September 10th. So we've done an event study here where we've, we've stacked the data according to the date of landfall. And what you can see is that inflows dropped by about 20% in the week after the hurricane hit in both cities to the tune of roughly 400 bucks. So we often focus on the spending picture, but it's important to note that actually people's incomes dropped also. Now, in, interestingly, in both cities, those inflows recovered quite quickly. Actually, they recovered more quickly in Houston than they did in Miami. And we can talk about maybe why that might be. Spending picture, just straight up outflows, checking account outflows. So spending could be transfers I'm sending my mother, could be all kinds of things. Here we see an even larger disruption. Outflows dropped by about 30% in the week after the hurricane hit, about 500 bucks. Now what's interesting about this is that we're showing Houston in blue and Miami in orange. And there are two things to note. First, there's actually a, 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 a an elevation in outflows right before the hurricane hit, right? This is the preparatory spending that a lot of people are doing. Um, principally, it's in grocery, it's in fuel, it's in home expenses. People are doing mitigation uh, to prepare their homes from th for this major onslaught. Uh, and then, of course, when the hurricane hits, you see this massive downturn. But the other thing to note is that that uptick in spending happened earlier in Miami and the downtick happened earlier in Miami than it did in Houston. And what we think is going on there, though this is purely an interpretation, uh, is that evacuations were called for in Miami, right? So people, and there was a, a lot more advanced notice, I think meteorologically, about the storm, right? It had already gained, it was already a category five storm, you know, five or six days, or I, I think before it made landfall in, in Florida. Whereas Hurricane Harvey, kind of accelerated very quickly, correct me if I'm wrong about that, but um, there was uncertainty about just how bad it was gonna be, um, and there were no evacuations caused. So it felt like the financial disruption just happened earlier in, in Miami compared to Houston. But, th but they are actually of comparable size, uh, despite the fact that I would argue that the, actually the, the, the rainfall and the, the impacts on Houston specifically were much more dramatic than they were in Miami, which actually kind of went unscathed relative to other parts of Florida. Okay. The other thing we did was, so to, to shed a little bit more light on, the, on this outf these outflow categories, uh, we wanted to understand, given that you know, there's an uptick in spending right before and then there's a downtick, what's the cumulative impacts of a storm like this on you know, the economy, the local economy. So what you're observing here, the way to read this chart is on the left, Hurricane Harvey, now we're looking at weeks. And as of 12 weeks after the storm, people had spent roughly 33% more on home expenses than we would have otherwise expected relative to the baseline. They spent 13% more on car repairs. Uh, generally speaking, their outflows had fully recovered. It was about 1% higher than normal 12 weeks out. So in, in grand scheme of things, their total outflows sort of recovered what we would have expect the, them to have spent. But the distribution of what they spent on changed quite a bit, right? Because they're spending more on home expenses, more on car expenses. Look at the debt payments. The debt payments are the... Um, are, are the greens and the blues. And you'll note that 12 weeks out, people had made 12% lower mortgage payments than expected, 9% lower student loan and auto loan payments, and we saw a similar story in Miami, right? Here, um, the, the ex extra expenses on home and cars were smaller, right? I think in large part because the physical damage in Miami was less extreme. 
but you see, in if, if anything, a larger impact on debt payments. Student loans were 19% down, mortgages 16% 6 down, auto loans 7% down. And I guess it's important to remember at this time there was a lot of forbearance being offered, and so people may have just taken advantage of that. Uh, they may also have felt that they didn't know what was going on, and of course we did see that they saw an impact on their inflows that they may have needed to, to do this. Um, one final category I want to call your attention to is healthcare. This was the category, this is in yellow, that dropped the most during the storms. Uh, to the tune of roughly 60% drop at the time, uh, and, and even 12 weeks later, healthcare spending still hadn't caught up. So it was not just the case that people stopped going to the doctor or stopped paying off their old medical bills, but they didn't make that doctor's visit up, at least according to this, you know, uh, what, that's one interpretation, uh, even 12 weeks later. Same thing in Miami, right? Healthcare spending was the category that dropped the most and still hadn't recovered 10 weeks after the storm. So that we thought was actually a pretty important thing to underscore that you know, we don't know whether this is a disruption in demand or a disruption in supply, right? Was it just people had other things more important going on, their homes were flooded, they decided not to go for that checkup? Um, some of it could have been you know, really important care though. And um, so that's when we also wonder about disruptions in supply. Was it that you know, doctor's offices were closed, hospitals were closed? Uh, people weren't taking appointments because maybe the physicians and the, and the nursing staff couldn't get to the, uh, the, the healthcare facility. So um, just an important thing to underscore and just in, ter in terms of the sort of welfare implications of a storm like this on, on people's financial lives. One final outcome we looked at were checking account balances. And again, Houston is here in blue and Miami is in orange and you'll see that actually 12 weeks after the storm, checking account balances among Houston residents were about roughly 10% higher than they had been before. So this is kind of interesting because um, on paper they seem quite resilient, financially resilient. Uh, what they're doing though is they're slowing down their, those debt payments, their inflows have recovered, their overall spending uh, is sort of on par with what we would expect, but because of those slower debt payments, they're actually accumulating cash. So their checking account balances are going up all the while that their debt payments have slowed down and they're possibly accumulating more debt. Now, this may be because there's still a whole lot of other damage to their balance sheet, right? Their home, their car maybe may need repairs and so they're waiting to accumulate that cash to make a, you know, a, 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 an upfront payment to a contractor that's gonna repair all those damages. So this could be, um, this, the, this, I, I think this all makes perfect sense. Um, in, in the, or there could be very reasonable explanations for why we see this uh, growth in checking account balances in Houston, given the damages that, that, that were um, experienced there. Miami, we didn't see uh, this same growth in checking account balances, it was pretty flat. So that, what's interesting there is that people actually needed to slow down those debt payments in order for this to be true. Um, and so in some ways, maybe that was a financial resilience strategy for them in order to kind of keep some level of liquidity buffer. Uh, they were slowing down those outflows, those, those debt payments, in order to keep their balances like this. Um, but all to say, given the the differences in the events, um, both in terms of the weather and the damage, but also the policy impacts or the policy choices in terms of calling for, uh, you know, calling for evacuations in Miami but not in Houston. I think what this underscored for us was just what an, you know, this is a major economic impact that even a policy choice can have as, you know, in, in calling for evacuations, right? Even if there was no storm alone causing everybody to leave for two weeks and then come back is in, it, in, it, in it of itself an economic event that we clearly see in the data. Um, so I think I, uh, I'll stop there and we can talk about implications of this work, um, but all to, like in summary what we're really observing is that across very different events, uh, these storms really caused a lot of financial disruption in people's lives. Uh, we saw a similar story in, in, in terms of small businesses 
And similar story in terms of the, um, the financial resilience of businesses that their, their, their balance has dropped, but then, then quickly recovered. Uh, and that's, that's very much a cash flow picture um, and you know, may not necessarily reflect all the welfare and balance sheet impacts that both households and businesses may have experienced to their homes, their storefronts, their cars, et cetera. Thank you. All right. Bring up the panel. Everybody can come on up and take their seats. I'm gonna um, so while the panel's uh, um, taking their seats, we're gonna um, we introduced Howard and Fiona. Thank you for those great presentations. Uh, we're adding um, a few folks, and I just want to introduce them very quickly. Um, so we have Howard here, and then we've got uh, Sarah Singas from the Mortgage uh, Bankers Association. She spearheaded an interagency response team after the hurricanes last year um, uh, with the servicing in industry in particular. Uh, Andrew Huff has also joined us from the National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies. Uh, and then we have Amanda Edwards, who is uh, joining us from Houston, uh, Texas, where she um, is uh, the at-large council member for the city, and she's been working on the ground locally um, in the communities that were incredibly hard hit by Hurricane Harvey. So I think her perspectives on the data we see um, from, from the real on the ground um, perspective is going to be um, a great addition to this discussion. So, um, so, so if we could start with you, Fiona, just uh, your data is fascinating, but I do, I would love to start with um, your thoughts on the implications of some of the um, financial sort of balance sheet issues that that consumers were facing um, you know in these storms and I know you did some other work as well on uh, you know um, on um, the economic loss and business loss and you know and how that translates but uh, your last slide was fascinating I, th I thought in terms of um, the, um, the 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 Houston picture looking so like cash flow was looking pretty steady, and I don't know if that has anything to do with um, any monies that were becoming available quickly. Any, just any observations you have on that, and then sort of the implications of that, yeah. if you could talk a little bit more about it. Yeah. Uh, so we didn't go through the painstaking effort to find the strings that might have, been, you know, the, that come in on a, a electronic payments of, of disaster relief and, and individual assistance payments. So I can't say whether those, the checking account, balance growth is in part due to uh, relief. But it, it, in the, in, it, it is a wonderful stock measure of yeah. all things going on in the checking account. So it could well be both relief as well as you know, insurance payouts, anything, any economic inflows that might have been coming in from that. Uh, but it was surprising. And in fact, initially, we were going to try to release the data even earlier, but we were uh, we, we really wanted to, do, we were like, well, maybe these checking account balances will go down if we have another month of data. And we added another month of data and it just kept on going north. So mm -hmm. it was surprising um, in terms of that trend. But uh, you know, talking to people on the ground or, or, or otherwise, everybody's hypothesis is that this is people stocking up cash because they have massive outlays they're gonna still be making to repair their homes and their cars. So don't know. Um, in terms of implications, I think certainly on the healthcare front, I do think this calls and you know underscores the importance of um, both supply and demand resilience, right? And in that, on the supply side, we definitely need healthcare providers to have generators, backup power sources, whatever, um, even resilient staffing models, mm -hmm. right? In order to be able to continue care. And on the demand side, I think it's important to underscore the resilience of demand. I mean, yes, maybe the, the checkup you don't need to get, but the dialysis you need to get, yeah, yeah. and you know, the, dr the drug adherence you need to get, and there's like continuity of care is pretty important, and that is a public health goal right. in terms of um, communicating to people they need to continue to me meet those healthcare needs, that that actually is pretty high priority um, is maybe something we could be underscoring more generally. Um, I guess more broadly, I think this does underscore uh, some of the data that Howard raised. You know, I mean, 10% of the housing stock sitting in the 100-year flood zone, and then another 20 to 25% sitting right next to that in a very high risk, not 100-year, 
but very high risk. And you know, sure, you know, you may not be required to have a conforming mortgage to have you know flood insurance, but you may just want to get it, <laughs> right? And 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 what are all the things that households could be doing to make themselves more resilient in the face of a storm? Yeah. And flood insurance being one, I think just generally having a cash buffer um, being another. And we've seen just we've been documenting along the way before we even took on this topic just how volatile people's financial lives are in general and that they need working capital to deal with those fluctuations. So uh, I think this, these types of events underscore the need for that. Yeah, well, I definitely want to, we want to, I want to come back to flood insurance um, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, a, in a minute, but the, that's a great point that you're making. Um, you know, in, in light of, you, of your point about the, the, the data that Howard shared um, in his presentation and the, um, the number of properties that are exposed or at risk, um, um, that are not insured, and just the magnitude of non-insured property that was impacted, particularly with Harvey. Um, we, we know that disasters are happening with greater frequency. They're likely to be more severe in the future. So uh, I'd love to get your perspective, and Amanda, you, you watched this play out um, on the ground um, in Houston. So and, and Houston is in partic has particularly significant issues when it comes to um, the, whether it's the zoning and the and the warehouses are being built and what the infrastructure looks like. Do you want to? Can you just talk a little bit about just kind of hearing those numbers and understanding the the impact on the ground? What your thoughts are on that? Absolutely. So um, I am a native Houstonian, born and raised, and now serve as an at-large city council member in Houston. And um, it's interesting because in the last three years, we've had three 500-year events. Obviously, the, you, the floodplain data is being reworked um, because clearly are, they're not really 500-year events if you've had three of them consecutively. But in any event, um, you have a significant amount of homes that um, were not insured that were affected by Harvey. And then you also have a significant amount of homes that were insured that were affected by Harvey. Harvey. Um, of course, the insurance requirement applies when you're in the 100-year floodplain, not the 500-year floodplain, which are those surrounding areas that were shown on the, on the chart. Um, we just regulated, as in a week ago, um, what happens now in 500-year floodplains. Um, this was something that did not come easy. There was a lot of discussion. Uh, it's a very property rights friendly place in terms of Texas generally, but in Houston as well. And so really kind of getting a regulatory paradigm in place that would not uh, be over, oversized, but, but really more targeted to trying to keep people safe and, and protect their homes. And so what we ended up doing last week was pass an ordinance that uh, required those homes that are new construction in the 100-year floodplain, now they must be built at the 500-year floodplain level plus two feet higher. And then those that are in the 500-year floodplain were not regulated prior to last week. Now their regulation, which will apply in September, so there is a grace period, um, but uh, nonetheless, those will be required to be built at the 500-year floodplain level plus two feet. If you're increasing your footprint of your home by more than a third, um, then you also be required to do that, that addition at the 500 plus two feet level as well. And the goal of this isn't to pull in if you're doing a slight modification or slight change to your house. We're not necessarily trying to pull in those kinds of situations, but if you're really doing some substantial work, and then of course you have substantial improvements that applies to the 100-year floodplain that come, is a construct of, of the federal government, you want to make sure that you're creating a dynamic where people are not putting themselves or exposing themselves to the exact same harms as they had been before. Uh, the other thing that's interesting now uh, is that you're going to start, they have not started, uh, I think there's going to be some kind of state or countywide campaign um, trying to advertise for people to get flood insurance. I happen to have flood insurance. I do not live in a floodplain. But I lived in New Orleans prior to, move, prior to moving to Houston. So not everybody's experience uh, in buying their home, their first home, was having lived in a city 
uh, city of New Orleans after Katrina happened. So in my view, that wasn't optional, but that was an unusual experience to have lived in New Orleans first and then moved to Houston and buy flood insurance. Oftentimes, people just rely on whatever their realtor says to them, and they say, oh, you need it or you don't. And that's typically the way that it works. And I think now, obviously, people will be de thinking about this much differently after how much devastation was caused after Harvey. Thank you. The, um, so, uh, so on the insurance uh, front, I wanted to um, ask a couple more questions. I mean, the um, insurance industry, and, and Howard, also, you had an amazing stat. I forgot what the insurance company was, but the losses um, that were reported. Um, and, and just this sort of, if we continue to see things of this magnitude, is um, it's staggering. And, uh, and obviously, um, federal government, um, even local government, and, and city government even are looking at, um, you know, as these things get more, um, more aggressive, more pervasive, and more expensive, um, how, how we're going to deal with this. Can you just tell us a little bit about, from the insurance perspective, um, and the aftermath, kind of what you saw, and also just on the flood insurance um, uh, side of things, uh, you know, there's been a lot of um, recent activity on the on the on the national uh, flood insurance program. Maybe you can um, just share with us your insights from the insurance perspective and the industry. Sure, perspective. absolutely. So, gosh, so we're up there on Capitol Hill fighting every day to make homes more resilient. So, uh, you know, going back to probably I think in 2010, the insurance industry opened what's called the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety down in uh, Chester County, South Carolina. And at this facility, they're able to simulate hurricanes, wildfires, tornadoes, earthquakes, wind damage on homes. And I've really figured out those very small tweaks to building codes that can be the difference between a home standing or completely destroyed after a disaster. Now, the shocking thing is um, the folks on Capitol Hill didn't seem to quite get that for a long time. And so in 2011, we formed what's called the Build Strong Coalition really in an effort to change the way the federal government approaches disasters and resilience. And so uh, that coalition is made up of uh, firefighters, architects, emergency managers, contractors, building code officials, and we're really all uh, fighting to make homes more resilient as well as businesses. And so, um, you know, gosh, what we've been working on in the past few years is trying to incentivize states to adopt and enforce stronger building codes. So it's pretty shocking uh, the lack of states that have strong building codes in place. And so what we call, we call that a, uh, an endless cycle of destruction, where states build homes back after disasters to the same subpar standards that led to their destruction. And so we've been really working to educate lawmakers on Capitol Hill about the very small tweaks to building codes, like a door opening out instead of in, or roof straps being applied, or ring shank nails. And so these very small tweaks, which you know a lot of times are less than the price of one of those new granite countertops can be the difference between you know, a home standing after a disaster. And so we actually had a pretty big breakthrough this year. Um, so I think we've testified probably 10 times in Congress over the past few years on this issue, um, calling for the same reforms over and over to incentivize states to adopt stronger building codes. Um, and in the wake of Hurricane Harvey and Hurricane Irma, I think it became very evident, especially in, uh, in the case of Irma, that the strong building codes uh, put in place after Hurricane Andrew, uh, when the Florida Building Code was adopted in 2000, that that really made a difference uh, in the wake of Irma, where a lot of homes were standing that wouldn't have been standing after Andrew. And so I think that really had an impact, as well as obviously the horrible devastation in Houston. And, um, and so this February of this year, uh, uh, a provision was signed into law. It's a really major provision, and I w I'm really excited to tell you guys about it. So it would increase the post-disaster federal cost share for states by 10% based on a state's resiliency rating. So FEMA right now is creating this resiliency rating for states. We're working with FEMA to do that. And so if states will be rated on, one, the adoption and enforcement of strong building codes, uh, two, participation in the community rating system, investments in disaster mitigation, um, creating tax incentive programs to encourage resilience, as well as investments in disaster relief, insurance, and emergency management programs. And so one of the things Howard talked about was that lack of insurance take-up rate. And we see that so often across municipalities that are actually discouraged by the current laws to purchase insurance because of the way it's calculated and the ability for that municipality to receive Stafford Act assistance after disaster. And so we're working to change those policies on Capitol Hill. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, going back uh, a little bit to what Fiona said, you know, FEMA says 40% of small businesses 
never recover from a natural catastrophe. And an even more shocking stat, 90% of small businesses don't reopen unless, unless they resume operations within five days after a disaster. So, you know, it's pretty devastating what these things can do. And, you know, obviously, I think the main thing we can be doing is really changing the culture of preparedness and building stronger um, and encouraging states to do that. And I think also invested in pre-disaster mitigation. We pro we've probably all heard the stat, $1 can save 6 to $8 on the back end. But yet, in spite of that, our federal government, I think in recent years, has spent 14 times more on mitigation after instead of before disasters. And so we're trying to reverse this approach with our federal government. I think we're making some headway. We're really excited to see in the omnibus bill passed earlier this month or late last month, $250 million on budget this year for pre-disaster mitigation, which is a huge increase over previous years. So we're really excited to see that. We think it'll give communities a whole lot of more resources to defend against disasters. Thank you for that. That was great. Um, so on the same, in the same vein, let's talk about mortgages, Sarah. Um, you know, one, one of the things we know, um, consumers who own property, you know, the first phone call they might make is the insurance company. The second one's their mortgage uh, company. And then, you know, looking at who, who they're going to pay and how they're going to handle a situation, especially if they know there's damage. Um, and renters are calling their landlords and I'm um, trying to figure out what they're going to do or reporting what had happened to the property. And, um, and, and that, um, those first few phone calls are really, really critical in terms of um, the actions people take and, and the options that they're going to have um, depending on the, on the damage. I know um, you spent a lot of time with the servicing industry after the disasters in 2017 um, and uh, looking at the damage across the board um, to the mortgage industry. There's a lot of concern about defaults and people um, having, knowing that they have options for um, forbearance and different programs. Um, we've seen a lot of activity. I know um, HUD has spent a lot of time on the ground. Um, they've also rec recently released some new policies. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac um, have put out um, new, uh, new guidance to really help. And really, it was not so much that everyone didn't understand that there's maybe a 30, 90 day forbearance period, but that these things were going to take longer than that period and what were people going to do and how are they going to make decisions and, and how they'd be impacted. So talk a little bit to us about um, the, the mortgage industry's response and some of the um, kind of key areas where, um, where you saw uh, the industry um, you know, taking, taking a, a leadership role um, or how they were um, responding to um, ensuring that consumers had the information that they needed um, on the ground uh, during, during kind of in the midst of the chaos right. of, of the disaster. Right, well, you know, to, as, as Howard and, and everyone on the panel has mentioned before, 2017 is just uh, unprecedented in terms of the storm, the damage, the magnitude, um, the geographical area that was impacted. And so um, right away we knew that uh, the mortgage industry came together quite quickly with uh, other industry stakeholders um, because we knew that things were going to be uh, very different this go round than in previous uh, storms. And we needed a better toolkit to respond to borrowers because the, the, not only were these disasters different, but the world is different now. Um, and, and the housing um, market is different. So uh, really shortly after Harvey first hit, um, we, we got a group together with the Housing Policy Council, uh, Mortgage Bankers, American Bankers Association, uh, Five Star and Urban, and we met with the joint federal housing agencies. Um, and they were very receptive um, uh, to meeting and coordinating uh, these efforts quite quickly. Um, and we were all there to, to do a couple of things. One, to talk about what the immediate short-term needs were for borrowers that we were seeing, and to share some information from the boots on the ground. Um, you know, in the weeks uh, and in even months after these storms hit, there was, um, it was hard to get data on just how bad the damage was in, in various places. Um, that, that was, um, you know, getting an idea of the estimate of the losses and the extent of the damages is really important in terms of trying to figure out what programs um, are needed and how to best respond. But that information took, um, it, it just wasn't as easy to get um, right away. So um, a few of the things that we worked with the joint housing agencies to um, 
get resolved fairly quickly, and I, and I have to give credit to uh, the agencies, Fannie and Freddie, um, FHA, VA, and rural housing, um, all did a, an amazing job of coming together quite quickly. Um, some of the short-term things that, uh, that they were able to pull together um, were uh, a waiver of trial payment plans uh, requirements, um, waiver of um, uh, certain documentation requirements make it easier to get borrowers into uh, longer term payment solutions. Um, the, the, another key issue that came up quite quickly with these storms, and I think it was because you know now we're in the age of social media where people almost instantaneously can share information across a wide variety of, of groups is that um, People are talking almost immediately about what kinds of options were available after the forbearance period was over. Um, there was some misinformation where uh, uh, borrowers were um, under the impression that that forbearance period, the amount of payments that were um, skipped during that forbearance period may not have to be made up. Um, and, or there was some information out pretty quickly that uh, you, you can take advantage of this uh, forbearance period and the, the payments for the number of months that you missed during this period would just be tacked on to the end of your mortgage and you would just resume after the forbearance period was over, you would resume making your normal contractual payment. That's a great idea um, and it makes a lot of sense, but at the time the storms hit, that wasn't available for... Fannie or Freddie, uh, FHA, VA, or rural, it just wasn't uh, a, a modification or a payment assistance option that would work that way. Um, but we were able to work with all the groups and, and get something very, very similar. So uh, Fannie and Freddie announced this disaster extension mod, which essentially works, like I said, you take the number of payments missed and you tack them on to the end. So there's not any disruption, um, the, the capitalized interest um, can be waived. Some, some services will waive that capital interest that's accruing, capitalized interest. Um, and it, it makes so much sense for borrowers who were current prior to the disaster and would be able to resume and pick up <laughs> paying like they had been paying, but needed some assistance with dealing with that that lump sum of, of the missed payments. So uh, paying it back all at once would be difficult. Entering into a repayment plan where you spread uh, those, that lump sum out over a period of, of months uh, still would be kind of difficult because that's, you're adding that on top of your normal mortgage payment. And um, these are the borrowers that it didn't make a lot of sense to go through a formal modification process with either. So they could have had their loan at a low interest rate and they could have been paying on it for many years and making them, offering a modification that would extend the term um, back to the you know original 30 years or whatever or that would put them into a higher interest rate really didn't, didn't make a whole lot of sense. So um, it, the agencies worked really quickly to get that done. Uh, VA and rural have done something very similar. Um, and FHA has put together um, a, they can't quite do it that way, but it's a standalone partial claim for certain situations where borrowers meet these, these criteria. Um, and, and I think it's a little, it's still a little early to see, but I think I think that's going to be tremendously helpful in helping uh, borrowers uh, recover. Um, there's still uh, open issues about what happens through the next natural storm. And as we've heard, we can expect 2018 to be, to likely be as bad or maybe even a little worse than what we saw last year. Uh, these programs are put in place, uh, FHA for example, that will sunset. They may. Some of these modifications and policy changes that were, were very helpful were disaster or storm specific or area specific so that, that it would not necessarily be available um, in future uh, disasters. So 
um, moving forward, we want to make sure that we can take these lessons learned, see what's working and what works this go round, but, but hopefully get them put into policy that is uh, long term that would apply across uh, many disasters and across future so we're not you know reinventing the wheel every year yeah <clears throat> that that's um, critically important um, and one of the things I think um, that that the industry uh, and would should continue to push for in terms of having consistency because we know there we know there are going to be more disasters Howard is that right yep. uh, and um, and we we know that there are um, it's not going to get easier and and so the ability to be able to take these things and have the toolkit in place um, for local responders and others that are trying to understand the dynamics if that was more consistent I think um, there would be a lot of opportunity for I mean that would be a great thing for the industry if we're able to kind of learn from that and be able to apply that in the future um, so so Howard I, I just wanted to I mean you've talked about um, a little bit about um, just the, the cost and the magnitude and the kind of expectations and your report goes into that across all kinds of different disasters. Um, but uh, can you just talk a little bit about um, just when we think about preparing, you know, you, you see all this data and you have all the science and everything mm -hmm. behind that. Um, you know, Andrew mentioned that mitigation needs to be happening before these events occur. Um, we're talking about risk mitigation strategies and, and the like tonight. So do, can you just comment a little bit on where do you think there are opportunities for, whether it's from an industry consumer point of view, um, how the data and the science can, can be more, can be helpful and proactive in, in, in um, mitigation strategies? Right. So, I mean, part of my job with, with Chief Actuary, working with the science analytics team, is um, we have a, a large number of uh, PhD scientists that build actually models to estimate natural catastrophes. We have some models that will, will provide a score from 1 to 100, depending on the risk, and then we have models that will actually, we have simulated events, and we can figure out what it would be the damage, you know, if, if this set of circumstances happened with this, say, uh, a hurricane, if it has this, this amount of winds at this location, this is the property, what would the loss be? Um, and a lot of that is done through studies like with the IBHS. And um, then we also, depending on the, the, the nature of the, the building, if it's been mitigated, some of those mitigation uh, numbers will be built in as well to, to raise or lower the, the estimated loss based on what was done or what wasn't done. Um, but, but again, right now, in terms of mitigation, I'm spending a lot of time uh, you know, working with, with our insurance customers, um, with some of the state departments of insurance, actually having those discussions about mitigation and, and what can be done and, and what do our models do relative to mitigation and to account for all that. But it, it's really interesting, um, and this was going on in, in Florida, for example, with wildfire before the, the fires even hit. So um, it's, really, uh, it's really become a, a very, uh, very important topic right now. But I think what we're, what we're seeing, um, we're starting to see, so insurance companies have done a pretty good job of managing their risk using these catastrophe models. Um, the catastrophe models, were, you know, these, these, the models that estimate the dollars, really came into existence after, after Hurricane Andrew in, in the early 90s at Florida. And, and so insurance companies and the reinsurance companies that, that reinsure them have been using catastrophe models to help them estimate what could happen in one in 50 years, one in 100 years, you know, one in 500 years, you know, for, for quite a while. And, um, but we're seeing now, be, because of some of these pressures, and, and, and last year really highlighted it, that, uh, that, you know, some of the large banking companies uh, and even the, the GSEs are also starting to, you know, use our models to try to understand uh, what is the risk to their portfolio of, of mortgage loans. Um, the, uh, the the bondholders, you know, all the all the all the groupings of those mortgages that, that investors buy, they're interested now in, you know, what, what risk do I have on, on, on that that do I have that I'm not going to get any money out of this, and it's going to be a you know a lost cause. So it's it's uh, it's really interesting with with how these are all being built in, and, and we are seeing more and more uh, use of, of wanting to use the models to estimate, you know, what that what that financial crisis could be from from the impact of that. Um, the other interesting thing was, and I didn't mention it before, but we're talking about Houston. Not only were, the, were there uh, 
a, a number of homes damaged, but I believe that the last number I heard was something in the neighborhood of 50,000 cars that were totaled because they were in the flood. Um, so you just think about just even that as well. I mean, it's, it's more than just homes. It's, it's, it's in, and you mentioned businesses and people getting, being employed and there's just, uh, just so much yeah. there to, to, yeah. to, to consider. So as we know more and more, um, wh where do you think from, um, if, if just thinking from a consumer perspective, um, how, wh how can you prepare consumers for this, particularly when there's a knowledge um, of, you know, you're in a floodplain and you're making changes to the zoning and you're doing things to try to, to help make sure people are aware of the, the fact that they need insurance and, um, and then financially how they can be planning for that. But I, I, any thoughts and what, what are your thoughts on sort of areas where, um, where there can be more, uh, more done to really kind of prepare or help consumers prepare for disasters? So this may be, um, may be informed by a, a somewhat of a, a mixed or rosy picture that we saw in those checking account balances, but um, when we started digging into these different debt products, because we were so surprised of, of just how big of a drop there were in debt c payments across the payments, um, uh, uh, meaning across the debt categories, uh, we looked within Chase Bank to say, well, how many people are enrolled in auto pay? And it was only a third of Chase mortgage holders were en enrolled in auto pay. And for credit cards and for, you know, auto loans, it was lower than that. And then for credit cards, it was like 5% or less than 5%. And so that, my, I guess I have a question for Sarah because um, what percent of the time are people taking advantage of forbearance? Um, are they just financially disrupted, right? They saw a drop in their income and they had to buy a whole bunch more fuel and maybe flights to leave the area mm -hmm. and et cetera, but their home is actually totally intact? Or is it actually damage to their home? And, and I ask this question in part because to your question, you know, maybe, maybe we can get rid of some of those financial disruptions, right? Mm -hmm. Simply by automating people's financial lives a little bit more. And if I'm gonna fall behind in my payments because all of my devices have no battery mm -hmm. left, the branch is closed, and I literally cannot push a mortgage payment mm -hmm. or an auto loan payment or a credit card payment. The post office isn't. The post office is, right? <laughs> like, I literally can't yeah. transact. And, and by the way, right. it's like down here in terms of priority right. level of all the things I'm thinking about right now. So I may have just forgotten or I just couldn't. Um, those should not be reasons mm -hmm. why people fall behind right. and take yeah. advantage of, you know, a moment of forbearance, which is totally appropriate for many people. But I don't know. I, I wanted your reaction. Well, so th I think that's a great question because um, we do know that in Sandy, we expected there was an initial uh, forbearance period announced, and um, I, I don't know the statistics off the top of my head, but uh, you know, a good number took a, 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 a impacted uh, borrowers took advantage of the forbearance, but at the end of that forbearance period. Um, made it up right away because they had chosen to do, to, to hold that money in savings to see if they needed it. Mm -hmm. But the ones with ACH payments and the automatic withdrawals didn't take, as a rule, did not take the forbearance and did, mm -hmm. not, did not miss a, miss a payment. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I, I think that, that that does make a big difference. Um, one thing too with the forbearance that, that we saw a little bit, um, again, I don't have any hard numbers on this, but um, just anecdotal, an anecdotal conversations with some of our members that they would get calls from their borrowers, and this happened more, I believe, in Florida, or at least the examples were based out of Florida, where there was not damage to the home or to uh, the place of work. So they're really there hadn't been an adverse impact on that borrower from the, the storm. The borrower wanted to take advantage of the forbearance period to get some work done on their car, to use the money in, an, in another way, right. which, um, y you know, you can, you can kind of see the logic depending on how that forbearance is explained. But, but what we were really concerned with is that if, if a borrower didn't truly understand the economic and, and financial ramifications of that taking that forbearance period, 
in, in terms of their you know long term that they could end up inadvertently getting into a worse financial position than they were prior to the storm and it having nothing to do at all with damage or, or loss of, of uh, income from the storm. So we, you know, that's something that we, as we look at future disasters too, we wanna make sure that we do communicate about there absolutely this forbearance period when you need it, that's great. It's important that people know about it so that they, they are more in, incentivized, if you will, to, to come back home knowing that they've got that buffer if they, they need it, but also balancing that with, you know, making sure that people don't make a, a decision that could put them in a worse financial situation mm -hmm. that they don't need. Mm -hmm. So, Amanda, I just, you're hearing all this, I, w I really want to hear your thoughts, too, on the, on the um, having seen this on the ground and seeing the impact to consumers kind of dealing with this stuff as it was happening um, and the confusion and the, the need for communication and coordination and how do you, what do you think are some of the, the key areas in terms of thinking about preparedness on the ground that could be helpful? You mentioned new, you know, new ordinances, new regulations in place. Um, how, do you, how do you ensure that, that the consumer kind of gets that and, and can think about that from a, from a mitigating standpoint? Well, I think there are several things. I'll kind of walk you back in terms of the actual occurrence. Um, that Friday night in the middle of the night is when Harvey made landfall. And of course, as you all saw in the news, it did not hit Houston directly. It was never anticipated that it would hit Houston directly. Unfortunately, uh, the next day, it was a lot of uh, the it was sprinkling, it wasn't raining pretty hard, and we had told everyone to kind of hunker down and get enough supplies for several days. And so they're looking outside and they're saying, well, it looks like this thing might have passed us or we might be out of the woods. And so we said, no, 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 stay in your homes. You're not, we, you, you, the windstorm itself wasn't going to be your problem, it's the, it's the rain. And of course, what we learned on Saturday is that the rain was going to be a lot more intense. I was with the fire department during the days of the storm and, and after and, and just trying to get your community members the help that they need. I mean, even to the fact, effect of knowing who lives in your community. Um, you know, senior citizens, disabled populations, uh, there are programs available for people to register, at least here in, in, in Texas there is. Um, but having ability to aggregate that data, know where those folks are so that you can send the types of resources necessary, boats were utilized. And so really kind of having a volunteer network established, but being more importantly, understanding the importance of communication. One of the things that was quite troubling during the storm for us, you know, I got several Facebook message and text message requests to rescue people. And so, you know, we're text messaging. You be, 911 was fully inundated, fully inundated. And so people were in an emergency state. And, and gratefully, we did not have a tremendous loss of life because community members band together. They checked on their neighbors. Um, but you've got to be able to know who those neighbors are, check on them. You get to know them in a disaster like this. I think one of the things or a couple of themes that I want to make sure to cover is that while technology is great and I'm a big proponent of technology, I run the Mayor's Task Force for Technology and Innovation um, in Houston, uh, what is critically important is that you have a means of communicating with all uh, of your community members. So not everyone is going to be technologically connected. And so we developed a door-to-door -door canvassing program uh, targeting lower income seniors after the storm to make sure that they knew uh, here are the resources that you might need to utilize ranging from here, here's free furniture, here's what you call when there's a fraud case. You know, there's a lot of fraud that happens after a storm like this. Seniors asking me, should I, should I let this, this group, they're wearing yellow shirts, should I let them come and do work on my house? 
And so being alert and having strategies for hotlines for them to call is important. Um, getting them resources and then the case management needs. I want to talk a little bit about that because there is a tremendous amount of backlog on case management um, happening in the city of Houston. You don't hear loud cries, but there are a tremendous amount of people who were not prepared financially in any way, shape, or form to uh, handle something like this. And so they are quietly suffering. Uh, in our canvassing efforts, we went door to door checking on these folks and uh, just a few months ago went back to some of the areas and some of which are in the exact same circumstances, no flooring, no walls than they were when we first checked on them. And some of them did not remediate properly, meaning did not pull the sheetrock out of their homes or their walls because A, they weren't aware that that was something that was applicable to them, or B, it could be denial, or C, it could even be a situation they're not fis uh, able financially or physically to do the work needed. And so there are a litany of different in needs across the city that are very um, urgent and exigent. Uh, I say that here in Washington, D.C. on purpose because I don't know if that message is getting across to our federal government. And I want to make sure all of you understand that, you know, recently there was an $89 billion package that was passed uh, in the Senate in February, but $89 billion across Florida, Puerto Rico, Texas, California, um, you know, all of these different areas is not nearly enough. And the way that these things get funded is if you, you know, the first bites at the apple are usually the most substantial bites in terms of what an, a, a community or, or area will have access to. So I encourage you all to spread that message that there is still a tremendous amount of need, a lot of low-income folks that really need help. And, and, but it was an equal opportunity storm. It did not just affect people who were low-income, but I do want to communicate that message and really, really share how much suffering still exists. And unfortunately, it's a do-it-yourself mentality, and it's a very uh, uh, one that bands together as a community, but it doesn't make a lot of noise. And unfortunately, the squeaky wheel is usually what gets the grease. So I wanted to communicate that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you're, you're emphasizing that this point on the need for effective um, coordination uh, at the federal level, um, along with the state and local government level, uh, with industry um, and communication. And I think, I think those are things, a lot of lessons learned. Houston also, interestingly, I think, and I don't know if this has anything to do, I was just thinking, I keep thinking about your numbers about mm -hmm. cash flows in Houston. And, and um, the, um, Houston didn't lose power. Right? Am I am I right? And like, when, so when we're hearing, you know, the devastation in Puerto Rico, the um, healthcare um, issues, the the loss of life um, because of the lack of power and things like that. I, my understanding is that Houston, through this storm, that was unique in that because it was mostly a rain event for you. You guys didn't get a ton of wind. I think you had power throughout the entire um, most of the most of this. Largely, had, yes. Yeah. I mean, there was a you know that was a huge plus to be able to have the power. Um, but, you know, not everyone had power and not everybody, you know, if your house is flooding, flooded, you may not be a place that has power. So, I mean, it wasn't widespread and across the board, yes, but generally overall trajectory that did help a lot. Yes. Um, in addition to the fact that, I mean, even though it, a flood event is, is difficult in terms of the, the, the actual debris removal. So that was a challenge that we faced also because it's a very dehumanizing thing to drive up to your front yard every day or past it as you're going to wherever you're staying because you can't stay at your house and see all of your belongings strewn across your front yard and wonder when is someone going to come and get this. And it was a very interesting time because we had to, we were competing with Florida um, because wind damage storms right. are a lot easier to clean up and pick up and it's more cost effective for uh, those companies that engage in that business. And so it was, it was, it was, there were some unique challenges after, uh, after Harvey. Right. So we've got to be prepared for all of it. Yes. And it's very expensive. You mentioned, very expensive. That, you mentioned the $89 billion package. I'm glad you did. And I, um, I, I want to f stop and just a uh, final question I'll ask before I turn it over to the audience. And again, if you have questions and you're watching on the webcast, events at urban.org, um, send your questions in. But in the, in, in the, in my last question to you guys on the financial side is who, $89 billion 
let's all, you know, to spread across, um, given the magnitude of what we saw in 2017 and the, and the number of occurrences we saw, um, you know, billions of dollars of losses in the insurance industry, um, the mortgage, um, mortgage losses, um, and then consumer um, complete loss and devastation financially in a lot of cases. Um, and, and who is paying? Who, who is going to pay um, as this continues to build and the severity and frequency of these events pay and the 89 billion we add on to that in 2018 and 19 and 20. Um, uh, I, it was a question, a conversation I know the industry had a lot was, is who pays um, at, at the end of the day? And I think it's an important thing to be thinking about. I'd love to hear, Andrew, your perspective, but I'd love to, if anyone else wants to kind of weigh in because um, we know who suffers, so who pays yeah. um, what, these billions of dollars and how are we prepared uh, uh, as a nation to, to deal with what is ahead? That's a really important question. So the, uh, I guess to answer your question, it's all off-budget dollars paid for by the nation's taxpayers. And if you look at you know, this sort of upward trend in taxpayer costs covering post-disaster cleanup, it's pretty astonishing. So if you go back to the 1950s, Hurricane Diane hit South Carolina, the federal government covered about 6% of total losses. Fast forward to Hurricane Hugo in the 80s, that number rose to 25%. Katrina, <coughs> 50%, and after Sandy, the federal government covered 77%. I'm not sure what the actual percentage will end up being as a result of Puerto Rico and, and Harvey and Irma um, and Maria, but you know, I think it's, you know, it's obviously a really shocking number when you think that in the past 30 years, the federal government and taxpayers have spent more than $1 trillion. And of course, uh, victims of disasters should always be made whole. That's the first and foremost priority. But again, if we uh, just do more pre-disaster mitigation and give communities more tools to mitigate against the risk of things like flooding, things like elevating homes, um, um, just you know, uh, uh, mitigating against wind damage, I mean, those kind of things will really reduce the need um, you know, for disaster assistance. But again, like I mentioned earlier, you know, in previous years, really, the, you know, really in our nation's history, FEMA has always, in the federal government, it's not just FEMA's fault, the federal government's really always been focused on the reactive side instead of the proactive side. And so we're trying to, you know, really, in Congress, create that shift between, uh, from reactive to proactive in terms of a pre-disaster mitigation investment. Fiona? I mean, I, I think it's sort of either the government or insurance, right? Either you, you've got risk, and you, either you insure against that through an insurance product, um, and so you, you do it privately, um, or the government sort of serves as an umbrella insurance, right, w and plays an uh, that public good role as an insurer, which is essentially sort of what these dollars also do. And so I, I think it has to be a mix of both private insurance and public insurance. And, but uh, essentially that's what, I don't know, that's how I sort of think about it in, ter in simple terms. Sarah, did you want to weigh in on? No, I agree. I think I, I think it has to be a mix. I don't think the I think up till now the federal government keeps carrying a uh, a larger and larger uh, portion of that risk, but um, it just it's not sustainable over the long term. And knowing that the the storm frequency and severity is go, is is increasing, and so um, the the damage is going to increase. Um, I think we've we've got to make sure that risk is spread out better. Um, and and that and the the private market has to really be able to 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 develop in a more robust way so that that risk can can really be spread out and also that I mean hopefully the the idea then would also be that it would um, by spreading the risk and, and increasing private sector involvement that the the uh, price to consumers would uh, in many situations hopefully be reduced and the the, the product that, that, that would be available could be, uh, there would be a, a broader variety of, of choices and, and products that would better fit the, the property and the, that you know, particular risk for that uh, uh, home or, or business. So I, I, I think it's gotta, it's gotta be shared much more equitably than it, than it is now. Uh, I could not agree more. And, uh, you know, um, Amanda brought up the vulnerable populations um, and their experience in this. And, and, I mean, I just can't, you know, the, the, um, the, the numbers have shown a lot of the communities that are, uh, have been historically 
um, impacted in New Orleans and 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 um, Katrina is a is one that we have lots of data on that those um, those same communities have been historically underserved um, and the most affected by natural disasters and the government's um, role in helping in the recovery and sort of um, they may not be able to rely on the insurance industry because we're talking about the most vulnerable populations um, in a lot of these places and I just think um, when we think about that and, and the cost of that uh, and and the needs of um, of those that just are not that do not have the capacity and capability from a um, financial standpoint to be prepared and and to be resilient uh, as others as others might be um, we just have to keep that in mind I think it's a it's um it's a, it's it's a growing it's just a growing a growing concern and we've seen the we've seen the uh, the aftermath of that and and what that means to so many people being displaced and and what kind of road it puts them on um, from a financial standpoint as well. Um, I want to open it up to questions here in the room uh, and we've got lots of hands that have just come up. So um, we've got mics going around. We'll start here. This gentleman. Thank you. Uh, two parts. Uh, first, uh, given the uh, charts that were shown about the uh, depression, the delays in uh, debt payments, depression in uh, spending and other economic activity, that uh, like your perspectives on what types of financial instruments would enable uh, mitigating um, those uh, types of adverse events. And uh, also in addition, uh, in case you're familiar with this concept of uh, contingent debt, um, it was a topic last October around the Caribbean islands in terms of if you get hit by an adverse weather event, then you may get some temporary debt relief or a reprieve. And would there be any way of tying those instruments to resiliency measures so that the more you invest up front for better climate resiliency, the more favorable uh, those terms are? And could you could apply for both the private and the public sector. I want to just take the last question and then let the other panelists take the rest. Um, I think that's the part of the challenge when we think about the disaster recovery dollars is that you cannot just put a Band-Aid on a big gaping wound. And right now the way that our, those dollars that are made available have been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, you're not setting up these areas that have repeat events to actually become more resilient because they're able to do things like in Texas, like build the coastal spine or, or to really build enough uh, infrastructure needed to have appropriate flow in our, our flood mitigation pathway. So those are just things like additional reservoirs, things like that costs a whole lot of money. And again, when we're thinking about disaster recovery, it's important to think directly about the residents and consumers, but then also what mitigation efforts are going to be put into place as a result of these investments. And it really should be an investment so that you're not having to do the same thing over and over again. So I just want to make that point clear because I don't think the funding trends are supportive of right. that. That's a great point. I, just briefly, you know, for the consumer, I think you, you, you've either got credit or you've got savings. And um, on the savings side, I think, you know, we really do need to think about how can we leverage everything we've learned from the 401k world and setting the right defaults and automatic enroll and all of those things to just rainy day funds. And so I, I really like some of the proposals that have been put forth to intercept the paycheck and allow you know savings to be flowing into a rainy day account that's sort of facilitated by the employer um, you know in a way that allows that money to be saved without even me focusing on it right and and so um, I don't know I think about this as a, a more general uh, liquidity buffer that people need um, for their general resilience whether it's for a hurricane or a major medical expense or otherwise I think too when you talk about uh, these events, you were talking about these flood events, <clears throat> they're pretty much unique in that they're these large flood events and it wasn't wind or, or something that is more insured. You know, wind losses in Florida and, and along the coast of, of Texas are, are pretty much insured. Flood events are not because even if you have flood, you're in a floodplain, not everybody buys it and then um, and if you have it, there's a limit. So. Flood is, is unique in that, um, that it's much less insured by the, by the 
-hmm. by the you know private you know public insurance companies. Um, wildfire, you know, those are all insured. Um, and, and for the most part, having been in that world for 30 years before joining CarLogic, I mean, when there's, a, when there's a storm, there's a hurricane, every insurance company is sending claims people there and they're trying to get the money, the insurance money in the people's hands as soon as they can to get them going. And I think in these flood events, FEMA was there giving money for living expenses, but to the people that are insured, they're waiting to get any, any money you know, to start doing what they need to do for their, any repairs they need to make. But if, you, if you're insured, I mean, it's pretty much, you're getting something pretty quick. Mm -hmm. um, so there's an there's a interesting uh, dynamic with that. Yes. Right here in the black, thank you. Hi. Um, Two quick questions. One, does anyone have perspectives or is there any research plan to look at the mortgage um, industry's uh, policies towards claiming insurance proceeds? Uh, they can range from increasing the amount that's directly given to homeowners to if the uh, proceeds would pretty much cover the mortgage balance due, they take it and leave the homeowner dry. And second, Ms. Edwards, what's happened with the claims of people who um, were damaged, flood damaged by decisions of the county or whatever to flood certain areas? And has the mortgage industry be been behind any uh, collection efforts for those people? I'll take the second question. Um, uh, there were a number of homes that were damaged, um, not because of natural flooding, but because uh, man-made flooding because of pressure needing to be released off of the dams in the area. And so there are several lawsuits um, presently in terms of uh, the decision to do that. Um, they were not local decisions, um, but nevertheless, there are different lawsuits because this actually happened in different contexts. Um, so that is happening, and then as far as uh, looking at what is happening with regard to providing mortgages and insurance, it's, it's the policy, the policy just generally is behind what's happening in private industry. Um, and so the basis for that is like, you know, we'd like to say or lay out this big map and say, oh, well, and these houses don't, don't bother rebuilding these houses or don't put a whole lot of money into this because we want to see more green space here. And we'd like to do that, but when you don't know what size of a pot of money or funding you're going to get for those, for policy solutions, it's hard to promulgate policy that you can't support with the funding needed to support those things. So if you said, we want this area to be, be bought out, you have to have money to buy it out. You can't just print the money to buy it out. And so we have had a challenge with regard to the slow nature of funding in terms of being able to have policy. So what you see in terms of what's happening within the mortgage industry is really all over the place, unfortunately. And so it really just is on a case-by-case -case basis as to what's happening with individuals and what they're willing to work out with their lenders. And I can take your first question just real quickly. In terms of the insurance claims and the disbursement process, that's actually not uh, any, the servicers don't have discretion over that. It's all driven by investor or guarantor uh, requirements. So. We did, uh, we did this in Sandy, um, and we, we learned a lot in Sandy about it. it it's a, a very big area of customer complaints and frustration. And there's a balance between getting enough money into the hands of the borrowers and the homeowners so they can start repairs and that they can get contractors because contractors are in short supply. And if you can't pay them up front, they're going to move on to the next house. But also then, you know, protecting against the fraud and the, um, uh, having an a unscrupulous contractor walk off with the entire insurance claim check. So it's a balance. It's trying, we've seen Fannie and Freddie adjusted uh, the initial disbursement amount this, this go round. Um, and I, I suspect that that is something that, well, I guess I'll, I'll back up and say that might be an area where we don't want to get too specific for all future disasters because it really depends on the location, the value of the, the properties and the, the amount of damage and, um, you know, what, what you're looking at. So th that might be an area where we continue to need additional 
uh, uh, flexibility for future disasters to make sure we can tailor it. And by we, I mean really the investors that are dictating the, the, the process. But it, it, it is tricky. It's a very tricky uh, situation. Okay. Um, one last question, and I'll give it to you, and, and we're going to have to wrap up. Thank you. Um, there's legislation pending on the Hill to reform the flood insurance program and has many, many good elements in it um, that have been worked on for a number of years. We have serious concerns, even though we're fully supportive of private flood insurance, I think it can bring capital market discipline to areas that's needed. Um, there are concerns with the operations of the House provisions in the way they're designed because to maybe to this last point, the way the current, it's complicated. You know, the way the system currently works is that when a disaster occurs, uh, an insurance company makes a payment uh, jointly payable to both the consumer and the servicer. Mm -hmm. And the servicer is, makes sure that the funds are used to repair the properties and uh, that the repairs are properly done. The House bill rep repeals the, um, the, what they call assignee, what they, there's a specific clause in there, it was a technical term, but at any rate, they repeal the provision so the, the payment would go directly to the consumer. So the consumer would not necessarily use the money to repair the, the, mm. the, the, the home. Mm. Secondly, um, the way the system works is that Fannie and Freddie currently, along with their investors, require that appropriate insurance coverage is maintained on the property throughout the life of the loan. This is for homeowners if you're in a flood zone for flood. Um, the second piece is, is that it forces Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to guarantee the mortgages even though appropriate flood insurance coverage is not maintained on the home. At origination it would be, but the policies only last a year, so a year out, the consumer would have the option of choosing, say, a much higher deductible policy. So if you had a $200,000 mortgage, for example, uh, they could choose a $150,000 deductible, storm hits, uh, they don't have $150,000, they're going to then if we combine it with the other provision that where they get the check directly, they're going to get a check for $50,000 from the insurance company, they're going to take the money, walk from the home, and walk from mm. their loan. And so that's going to result in community blight. And so, I, you know, I, I think that people are not understanding, it's a complicated area, um, but it is, it's quite serious. And so, uh, you know, I just bring that to people's attention um, because I think private flood insurance is desperately needed. The capital is needed. It can bring a lot of discipline to the areas, but the way the house provisions are structured, it's, it's very damaging. That's really interesting. So I'm actually not sure of those uh, very specific provisions. And I think there's what, about, about 600 sections in that bill, but I'll have to look up those, <laughs> those provisions. But you know, I, think, I think that bill does so many good things. I mean, first of all, it would reauthorize the flood insurance program on a long-term basis, which is just so desperately needed by policyholders. Clearly. I mean, we've had five short-term extensions <coughs> of the flood insurance program, I think over the past five months. And so policyholders are just sort of strung along from one extension to the next. And so I think that bill, you know, by being a five-year reauthorization is really, really important. That bill also, a lot of folks don't realize, puts $1.2 billion uh, on budget for flood mitigation for communities. And so I think that's really, really important as I've been talking about this whole night about mitigation. Yes. And that bill also creates a means-tested affordability program, which we look at as really important, um, obviously, to helping those impoverished communities, um, as well as addresses multiple lost properties. I think it actually creates a buyout program some of those multiple lost properties and so you know i think all those reforms combined together are just so needed as you mentioned private flood obviously is so needed to create more choices for policyholders but you know we, ha we we've seen uh inaction in the senate so far the house passed their bill back in november the senate has not been able to come to agreement around the long-term reauthorization and reform bill on the flood insurance program and so we're, we're trying to push congress to enact the program on a long-term basis with those needed reforms but um it remains to be seen whether that'll get done this mm -hmm. congress Thank you. What a great discussion, and uh, we could probably go on, um, and um, and certainly we'll be here uh, for a little while um, after. And please grab drinks or, or or chat with the panelists after this if you didn't get a chance to get your questions in. Um, I want to just.
point everyone to one um, bit of information. Um, the Urban Institute last year, after the storms, um, put out a, um, a series of research. We have a number of experts that were focused on um, looking at inclusive recovery, uh, you know, improved disaster mi uh, mitigation and resilience planning, uh, and really using the storms as a case study to do a lot of research and, and some really good work. Um, a lot of that was driven by um, Carlos Martin in our Metro Center and from our Housing Finance Policy Center uh, researchers as well. You can find all of that, um, that research. Uh, we have a collection of research that is on resilience in the face of disaster. Um, we, we have that now on the events page uh, for those of you that are online and for those of you that go back to your offices and want to take a look at some of that. Um, it really does uh, give a nice deep dive. The presentations will also be available online that you saw today um, on, the, on, the event, on the event site and um, information about um, contacting each of the um, panelists or myself. Um, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. I want to thank our panelists for being with us for this great discussion. Um, please join me in and thanking them uh, with a round of applause. And um, we'll, we'll be around, so uh, please feel free to come up if you have questions. Thank you, guys.